Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Dotson and I'm your host for Poetry Today. Uh, with me today is Deepika Mukherjee. Rubicon Press of Canada published her poetry chapbook, The Palimpsest of Exile in 2009. And The Third Glass of Wine was published by the Writers Workshop India in 2015. Her work appears in publications around the world, including Rhino, Post-Colonial Text, World Literature Today, Asia Literary Review, Del Sol Review, and Chicago Quarterly Review. She has performed her poetry at literary festivals in Malaysia, Netherlands, China, India, Myanmar, and Singapore, and has been the featured poet at Rhino Reads, The Woman Made Gallery, and Traveling Molly's in Chicago, The Hideout in Austin, and at Yet Do I Marvel in the Chicago segment of the Poetry Society of America's 2013 National Series held at the Poetry Foundation in Chicago. She has won prizes for her work in the United States and abroad and is contributing e editor for Jaggery and frequently writes for World Literature Today, Asia Literary Review, and Chicago Quarterly Review, as well as a fortnightly literary comma column excuse me, <laughs> for The Edge in Malaysia. She is a core faculty at Studio Chicago, uh, Story Studio Chicago, teaches at the Graham School, uh, U University of Chicago, and is affiliated to the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs at Northwestern University. Well, we're very thrilled to have such an international <laughs> uh, guest. Well, thank you. I am just absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Jennifer. Oh, of course. Yeah. And we all, because we always like to meet new poets, and right. this is what we're all about. So <laughs> okay. I guess uh, probably since I'm not really fami very familiar with your work, I would love to have you just dive in uh -huh. and share uh, some po poetry with us. Okay, um, I would uh, like to begin with a poem that will take everyone listening to this to India. Because right now what is happening in India is that there are a lot of student protests against what the government um, is trying to implement as a law which is discriminatory against Muslims. Now we've been through this in America <laughs> as well. And there is a fantastic Indian poet named Hussein Haidri who recited this poem in Hindi, Urdu, the languages of India. And uh, I heard it and I was just, I was just blown away. So I had to translate it and it is mm. right now up at World Literature Today. They put it up within like almost 24 hours because wow. this is just a poem for our times. So if that's all right, I'd like oh, to yes. begin with that. Yes, yeah. that sounds great. <laughs> okay. All right. The poem is titled Hindustani Musulman which means an Indian Muslim, by Hussein Hadri, translation from the Urdu Hindi by Deepika Mukherjee and Udit Mehrotra. On an evening stroll down my street, the Azan echoes stops my feet, reminds me it is time to pray, but I start musing on that day. Bhai, what kind of Muslim am I? Am I Shia or I'm Sunni? Am I Koja or I'm Bori? From the village or the city? Am I rebel or a mystic? Am I devout or sophistic? Pai, what kind of Muslim am I? Do I prostrate in submission or am headed to perdition? Is my cap my identity or the beard shaved off completely? Recite Quranic verse I could or hum the songs of Bollywood? <laughs> Do I chant Allah every day or fight the sheikhs in every way? What kind of Muslim am I, Pai? I know I'm an Indian Muslim. I'm from the Deccan and UP. I'm from Bhopal and from Delhi. I'm Gujarati and Bengali. I'm from the high castes and lower. I'm the weaver, I'm the cobbler. I'm the doctor, I'm the tailor. 
The Holy Gita speaks in me, an Urdu newsprint thrives in me, divine is Ramadan in me, the Ganges washes sins in me. I live by my rules, not for you, I've smoked a cigarette or two. No politician rules my veins, no party has me in their chains, for I am an Indian Muslim. I am in Old Delhi's bloody gate. I am in Lucknow's magical maze. I am in Babri's demolished dome. I am in the blurred borders of home. In poverty of slum dwellings, the madrasa's shattered ceilings, the embers flaming a riot. I am in the garment stained with blood. I am Hindustani Muslim. The Hindu temple door is mine, as are the mosque minarets mine. The Sikh Gurdwara hall is mine. The pews in churches also mine. I am 14 in 100, but in these 14 not othered. I am within all of 100, and 100 is the sum of me. Don't view me any differently. I have a hundred ways to be. My hundred nuanced characters from hundreds of storytellers. Brother, as Muslim as I am, I'm that much also Indian. I'm Hindustani Muslim. I'm Hindustani Muslim. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> and so yeah. powerful. These, uh, well, it's a crazy world that we're living in. It is. And I, I guess what I liked about this, it seems very empowering for the, um, uh, the, the narrator um, that these are my, this is the repetition of that phrase, this is mine, yes. and this is mine, and this is mine. I belong to all of these places, and I belong. Exactly. As opposed to creating that or reinforcing that idea of otherness. I, absolutely. Um, Yes, I, I, I think I really wanted to run with this poem because like we have been through very similar things in America as well yeah. where um, it seems like there is there are communities that need to assert that they belong whereas mm -hmm. others just do. And uh, in India, I am of the majority population whereas okay. in, in the US I'm not. So I felt okay. that as an Indian woman especially, I needed to speak up for the minority voice. Yes, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, and th the title of your book, The Palimpsest of, of Exile. Exile. So yeah. I had to look, I, before we met, I had to look, I was like, what is the palimpsest? <laughs> and so I was intrigued to discover that it's a manuscript yes. or an object that has been then with subsequent owners has had like marginalia or notes right. yeah. that then bec adds layers or depth Yes. to the, um, the original manuscript, mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. work. So a very intriguing idea, <laughs> but, I, the, but I was more intrigued. I was like, well, okay, so what does that mean for, in the title of your book? Palimpsest of, of Exile. Exile. Yeah. Um, for me, the main idea that I took from a palimpsest is erasure. Mm. and writing over something that has been erased um, okay. because monks in you know medieval times used to use these palimpsests which were again very expensive in those days because they would write on sheepskin or some sort mm -hmm. of a skin of an animal which is more difficult to sort of reproduce so it mm -hmm. was very um, it was very much about erasure of something that was no longer pertinent to the okay. monastery or something and then writing another, maybe a beautiful manuscript. Um, my life has been one of many sort of erasures and redoing because as a child of a diplomat, I grew up in many different parts of the world, mm -hmm. starting with Geneva from the time I was six months old. Oh, and wow. <laughs> okay. So French was one of my first languages, and then we moved to Jakarta, and we moved to uh, New Zealand. So my life has been one of perpetual sort of, you know, erasure and reinvention. Um, and even as an adult, I uh, came to Chicago in 2012. Before that, we were in Shanghai and Amsterdam, and in all these places, I have worked as well as written. So mm. I'm very conscious of the fact 
that whenever we move somewhere else or I choose to take a job somewhere else, parts of my identity have to be subsumed or almost reinvented and oh, erased wow. in some way to take on a new language and a new mode of being. Uh, for instance, if I was coming on a poetry talk show, let's say in Asia, I would probably be dressed a little differently than I am oh, here. Really? Okay. Well, not only because of the cold, but also, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's like it, it starts with uh, various things, but that concept of erasure and reinvention okay. and rewriting is very important to my own work, I feel. Yeah. And exile, because, um, yeah, I mean, I think. I always feel whenever I leave a place that I am really leaving it as, you know, as an exile almost. And I certainly feel that about India. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have, um, m I feel at home in three places in the world. Chicago is my primary home, but I also have a home in New Delhi. And I, I feel very much at home in Malaysia, in, oh, okay. in Kuala Lumpur. And that's where a lot of my creative work and especially my socio-political writing takes place. Okay. So. <laughs> wow. Uh, a very international um, experience, worldview and experience. That's, that's yep. uh, fabulous. Um, I, I know that you're, because uh, I had asked you to focus your um, bio mm -hmm. statement on your poetry work, but I right. do know that you are also a novelist. Right. And I guess I'm curious, okay, so... The eternal question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Poetry. I think uh, recently I was reading somewhere and someone introduced me from something I'd said at another interview, which was like, poetry has never abandoned me. Mm. And I truly feel that way. I think that poetry, um, I first published a poem at the age of maybe 10 and a half, 11. I'm not very okay. clear about this, but we were in New Zealand. Uh, you know, I was with my father, like following him around the world. And um, I had submitted a poem to the local newspaper and they had a children's page. So it wasn't like a big deal, <laughs> but they published my poem and they had my byline. And then, you know, friends and and just people started to say, hey, I read your poem. And I was hooked, you know, I was yeah. hooked that I could write something, send it out to the world and have it, in a sense, resonate with people. Yeah. So I was very young when I did that. And um, in my 20s, I came here for, you know, graduate studies. I've got a PhD in linguistics. So that sort of took me away from creative writing, but I was still doing poetry. Okay. And so I think that poetry, in a way, is, um, I, I feel that it sort of is in my blood. You know, mm -hmm. I, there are, I cannot do without poetry. I read it a lot. I m have some of the poems memorized. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, yeah, I just feel that poetry for sure. Although novels, they bring you more money. They bring you, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nobody. Let's get down to business. <laughs> Nobody's making money with poetry. You are so right, Jennifer. I mean, it's just like, you know, people will come and say, whoa, that poem was so great, but they'll never want to pay for a poem, right? I mean, yes. you know, even if they do, yes. it's like you get peanuts, whereas a novel, in a sense, also lives for a very long time. Sure. You know? Right. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just a crass materialist. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> well, I guess I'm intrigued, though. If poetry lives in you all the time, do you feel that um, your experience with poetry influences your writing when you do a novel? Absolutely. Even absolutely. though it's a, the novel is a longer, longer form. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just uh, I think I see things uh, very often poetically, if, 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 if that doesn't sound too arrogant, but you know, very often <laughs> when I'm describing a scene or, or a particular um, place, especially, I see it in very sort of poetic terms. You know, how do I build this up so that it's almost like a brief poem, you mm -hmm. know? And right now I'm sort of writing a memoir because of um, something, um, well, personal that happened in the family, which was tragic. and mm. and. I started off writing that as poetry. I just had like okay. little flashes of incidents because I didn't feel that I could take the whole memoir on. It was too raw mm -hmm. and I was crying when I was, you know, even writing the poetry. So um, what I did instead was I wrote like short poems and now the memoir is kind of growing around it. 
Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I love it. I, yeah. I don't know whether anyone will want to publish it, but I'm just going with it. I'm running oh, with it. Oh, that's great. I mean, mm. I, th I'm, I also um, facilitate. I, I don't like to use the word teach because I'm not really teaching people how to write more as I'm just sort of giving them permission to write. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to writing a memoir. Um, and, and so uh, oftentimes people have difficulty um, writing and uh, on those painful, painful exactly parts of them of their experience, uh -huh. and so maybe poetry is a, an entry point, and then you can expand yeah. on it with prose right. when exactly. you've had a little distance or right. yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, uh, or, I mean, or it gives you a structure. It gives you a structure too for that. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Um, um, yes, I, I sort of had to figure this out on my own just because, mm -hmm. again, poetry is just, I think, so much rooted in my subconscious that it's often the first way an experience speaks to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, nobody, I mean, you know, told me to do this or I didn't read it anywhere, but mm -hmm. it just expressed itself as poetry first. And um, I found the whole, you know, whole process very interesting because I haven't done that with a fictional novel mm -hmm. where I've started off with poems and built from there but the memoir just seemed to want to do that. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. That sounds very exciting. Well I hope that manuscript uh, when it's completed um, that whatever you want to have happen to it whether it's publication or just private for the right for yeah. your family. Um, Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. That, that whatever happens should happen. Um, uh, I would yeah. love to hear some more of your of your writing. Okay, um, I, yeah, I tend to write poetry that is kind of, uh, that begins from a point of rage. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> you know? right. um, Most of my writing, I think, is fueled by um, rage that I try to make uh, readable or at least, um, you know, people empathize with what I'm trying to say. Okay. So I really learned to, in a way, ma weaponize rage for my own, you know, literary purposes. Um, so what I'd like to read is, is a poem called Dynamite, which it was published in uh, New City, I think last year when they did like a roundup of Chicago poems. And uh, this was the time when the border crisis was really escalating and you know we were getting ready for Christmas but some of the children uh, the pictures that we were seeing mm. on the media were very heartbreaking so I wrote dynamite um, don't worry it's not a very intense poem okay. <laughs> I know it's like <laughs> all right dynamite the bus takes the curve on Wacker Drive past Tribune Tower, past the new Apple store. A boy, perhaps eight, whips out his phone, shouts, look, it's the tower. He takes a photo, carefully, fitting T, the final M and P on the phone frame. Click clicks, turns to siblings to ask, anyone got some dynamite? This is Chicago, so we smile. This golden boy with his family, father, mother, two siblings, on holiday, freckled and free, with eyes as blue as the Chicago River. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Anybody got some dynamite? Um, hey. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, this 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 really happened, and um, yeah. I mean, I just I just went back, and I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, now, so this was a poem that you wrote mm -hmm. based on a real experience, whereas the other one was um, uh, a, a translation. translation. Yes. And yeah. it was interesting. I was I you incorporated a lot of rhyme as well as. Uh, so a you used a lot of poetic devices in the translation. Is that was that a reflection of the original poem, or Absolutely. did you add? Yeah, um, Indian uh, 
poetic forms tend to be um, very, very sort of rhythmic and mm -hmm. rhyming and based on syllable structures because okay. Indian languages don't have the same stress that English does. Okay. So, you know, words are not necessarily stressed, but they're syllabic. Okay. Um, I'll try not to get into linguistic <laughs> thing too much here. Okay. But um, one of the things that uh, this original poem did have was Urdu is again a very, you know, uh, old poetic uh, courtier, uh, you know, courtier kind of language. Okay. And it tends to use a lot of rhymes and internal rhythms because mm. it's almost musical. A lot of them are actually set to music. Okay. So one of the things that I did want to do with the original poem is to keep the rhymes and the rhythms without making it sound like the cat ate the hat. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So okay. that was really the challenge, you know, to keep yeah. the meaning that he wanted. But um, I don't know whether you watched Martin Sheen recently. It is Martin Sheen, right? Um, if I'm not getting the name wrong. Um, recite a poem in, um, in Washington recently where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. Oh, no, I didn't okay. see that. This was, um, this was, again, you know, one of those rallies against, you know, what's going on out here. And <clears throat> the poem is by Rabindranath Tagore. Okay. And in English, um, it goes where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. And then, you know, it just goes on and on. I'm not going to give you the whole poem. Um, but in Bengali, if I translate it, uh, you can hear the, the sounds rhyming. Chitto jetha bhoi shunno, ucho jetha shir. There's already an internal rhyme in the okay. first two lines. So we lose a lot of that in translation sometimes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I would, well, I was very intrigued because people have asked, you know, I, or I see com competitions for people who do translations. Mm -hmm. So I was intrigued, um, and I, that seems to be a challenge. You know, yeah. you're you're translating a a poem that's got rich with either whatever is the form plus the sounds right. that you can't replicate in another language. Yes. You have to find substitutions that both capture either a playfulness with sound, right. um, as well as the, the sense. Absolutely. And sometimes you end up just keeping the gist of it. Okay. Because, you know, you can't do a line by line translation. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the poem that I just translated into Bengali for you, some of the translations in English are awful, even though they're done by the poet himself. Oh. Just because <laughs> you just cannot, you know, just do it. And, um, I see. Yeah. So... Yeah, it, it's a challenge. I don't know whether you teach translation, but translation is but a, it's exciting. another yeah, it's yeah. it's another big big thing that everyone's wrestling with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Um maybe I I think we probably have time for at least one more poem. Okay. Um Right. Uh let me see. Do you want um another Chicago poem or just a traveling poem that will take you from right now? Oh, sure. Why don't we yes? do that? Yeah. Okay, I'll do one that came out in, I think, uh, yeah, was it this one? The rhino that is here. I'm That's not really from 2012. Sure. Oh, okay. It's no, old. then this it's is, this is yeah, okay. No, this was later then. All right. This is titled, A Wanderlust Gazelle. My language is a Bedouin thief delighting in foreign sands. It understands the erasure of monks the ritual of palimpsests. English has no word for hemonto. No, not autumn, nor winter. No harvest goddess in a veil of mists, opaquely drawn. The evening lamp in her hand gleams lambent through the fog. Her voice merges into the howling wind with abundance, desolation. Every year, Mount Kinabalu is still wreathed in monsoon clouds. Cloud messengers may be different, but some still speak of love. Malay Laskars sang of narrow boats with pineapples stacked too high, a grievous vastness to this world beyond human experience. Wanderlust is a disease, incurable. Deep from within it chortles. The light of the moon cannot be rooted, Dipika. Do not even try.
Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> Thank that you. Is great. You know, and I do actually, uh, in some of my poetry writing workshops, I do try to teach that form. Right, yeah. I'm always struggling with it. And um, that is, I, I want to use that as an example. Oh, you, you're <laughs> welcome is, to. Like, that's yeah. Really yeah. I should also explain that my name means the light of the moon. So, oh, okay. oh, yeah. That's great. So, yeah. Uh, I know, so. I knew in the last verse you're supposed to include sort of the right. author's uh, kind of little like, hello. I know, <laughs> hello. This is me, and I'm writing. Yeah. So, wow. um, yeah. No, you're, you're, I would be honored if you would use it. Absolutely. Uh, that's but great. it is in Rhino, so it's very easily available. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Do you remember which issue or what year? Um, I believe it was 2016, if I'm okay. not mistaken. Right. Yeah. Well, Otherwise, try 2015. That. But uh, I think, yeah, just on their website, if you type in my name, I think it should pull it up okay. because it's up there. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And actually, we do have, if you've got another shorter poem, yeah. we, would ha we could have uh, another short poem. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, Bangkok, 1956. I'm going to read this because um, I wrote it as a poem and it got published as a short story. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, it's the work that's in the best short fictions 2019. Oh, wow. But okay. I really think I wrote it as a poem. So I'm going to just read it. Sure. All right. Bangkok, 1956. I will not be born for another nine years. It is my father's first posting, my mother is his bride. She leaves a sprawling home in Calcutta and 15 playmates to take his hand, crossing black seas to go where he will go. In a house as vast as her natal home, there is only the two of them, a maid, a gardener, and his family. Only silence speaks her language through cavernous days. He has not learned to woo her. They both married when told. But one day, he brings home a sari from the Parsi merchant. Look, he says, unfurling a shimmer of cloth on their bed. The rose color reminded me of you. He is colorblind. She sees a snot green of silk. It reminds her of mold on damp <laughs> monsoon drains. She picks up the sari, drapes the pallu coyly over her shoulder. She looks down at the ground and says, this is the most beautiful thing I have ever owned. Oh my <laughs> goodness, that is wonderful. Thank you, thank that you. That is yeah. very beautiful. Wow, and 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 thank heartbreaking. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, again, you know, it, these things come to, yeah, as as a flash of of right. just a vision of something, and poetry for me is like that. Yeah. Wow. Well, it has been so wonderful to talk to you and and to share in your poetry and your writing and. Um, we hope that you will uh, continue to in inform us, and, and maybe <laughs> maybe you can would be a, a featured poet for us um, at uh, 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 one of the Highland Park poetry readings that we have. Sometimes at Coffee Speaks, but at different locations around town, we'd love to. Thank have you. you come. I would love to do that. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has been just a wonderful experience, and I've enjoyed talking to you very much. Yes, yes, it's been most pleasant. Um, and just the rich images that you have, I, I, I loved that, that Bangkok 1956 was uh, very stunning. So <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm becoming a great admirer of your work. <laughs> thank you. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, for joining me today and uh, sharing with us your uh, your work. You're welcome, Jennifer. I urge everyone to travel. The images just come automatically then because the world is just such a beautiful place. And so I know that, you know, um, of course, it is a privilege to travel and I understand that. But travel has just so enlarged my vocabulary and the way I look at the world as such. Sure, yes. And the fact, I mean, I'm sure your studies with linguistics mm -hmm. must expand also your ability to... I don't know, create resonance uh, in your work that... Um, um, yeah, in, in yes and no. Uh, one of the things that I think linguistics did for me as a graduate student is um, it allowed me to 
use the part of my brain that likes things divided neatly into categories and you know very it's it's a very scientific method okay. whereas when I write it's just so messy and you know things are all over I don't even know whether the next line is going to come in any way or I'm going to be blocked so linguistics in a way gave me the freedom to deal with words and the magic of words and where they come from and how they change.